actually i'm stressing because uh, it's easy to like if some things i want to see it again i can see through the lectures as well <laughs> i agree yes i i think that so recording the lecture is a great idea so today's lecture we will begin by discussing another uh, important special relativity effect the light aberration effect so here is the basic setup let me write it here light aberration or stellar aberration um, yeah i need to go to my notes the basic idea is simply that we have uh uh Uh, that we have a light ray, let's say uh, somewhere here. I'll maybe I'll draw it this way. So this is going to be a frame. We're we are looking at we are looking at the situation in a particular frame. We've got x zero, x one, and let's say that this will be x two. Then we have a null vector representing a light ray or direction of propagation that this will be the light ray okay but we assume that we also have another um, that we have another frame let's say over here it will be this one. This is x. This is x zero tilde x one tilde, and x two will be the same. So this new frame is boosted with respect to the. Uh, let's give it. Let's give them a name. This will be Q. And the orange one will be called the amber one will be called. Uh, and now this null vector came u if we decompose it in our p frame so this is in p has some kind of zero component related to the energy and it has some kind of spatial part called k uh, and now uh, uh, we can define the spatial vector representing the direction of propagation, so the direction from which the light is coming. It's a three-dimensional vector in this P frame. And we simply define it as minus K over K0. So since K mu is null, we can write it, uh, we can write it this way. Sorry. I can write it this way. So since k is null, k times k is equal to zero. This means that k zero is equal to the length of k. This was, I think we proved it here, here during the lecture. So uh, if we divide k by k zero, we get a normalized spatial uh, vector, which represents the direction from which we see the light coming. So if the uh, vector of the formament of the photon is in this direction, an observer would see the light coming from exactly the opposite direction, and hence the minus. And now here's the thing. It turns out that, that if we boost the, uh, if we consider the same situation and the same vector in, in the boosted frame, uh, the spatial direction will appear a little bit different. Uh, so we compare, so we compare the direction from which the light appears to be coming. Uh, and we do it uh, in P and in Q. Uh, so in order to 
pass to the uh, Q frame, we have to perform a Lorentz boost. This is fairly straightforward. So let's do it. Mm, this is the Lorentz matrix. Mm, and we apply it to K, which is K zero. Okay. Or if we call this lambda, this is lambda times uh, one minus R times K zero. So what I did is simply uh, I took K zero out of both out of all components of this vector, and I get one minus R here. So let's now calculate this. And what we get is, if you calculated this correctly, this is gamma plus R3 B gamma minus R1 minus R2 minus gamma B minus gamma R3. Honestly, I'm just copying my notes here. Um, so K0 tilde is basically this guy here, K0 times gamma plus R3 V gamma. And from that, we can see that the new direction R in the Q frame, that's basically minus K divided by K naught. So we take this guy together with chi zero and uh, divided by this thing here. Well, this is just R1 divided by gamma one plus R3 V, R2 divided by gamma one plus R3 V. And here there is V plus R3 divided by one plus V R3. Uh, okay. Uh, So what is happening here? Uh, so here the boost is performed along the direction Z, if, if you look carefully. Uh, let me go back here. So you see the boost is obviously along the direction of Z. So X and Y or X2 and X3 uh, will certainly behave differently than X1. And indeed that's what happens. What we see happening uh, is that obviously uh, the R3 component gets uh, increased by the value of V and later decreased by something somewhat smaller. And there is some impact on R1 and R3. So let's try to parameterize things a little differently. Uh, we introduce the angle theta mm, as simply the angle between the z-axis and, and our source, and therefore theta is equal to arc cos r3, or z. Um, and now let's see what happens. Mm, so theta in the new coordinate frame is obviously arc cos v plus r3 divided by 1 plus v cos, cos theta. Let's write this as cos theta. Mm, yes. And you can all... Uh, now, what we can see is that basically uh, okay. So let's try to linearize this in V over C. So what happens for small 
velocities or v smaller than one because we have c equal to, to one. Uh, we write theta as uh, we write theta tilde as theta plus a small change of the angle. We write v as small delta v. Uh, and now uh, let's write this again as cosine theta equal to uh, v plus cosine theta one plus v cosine theta. We can linearize this uh, with respect to theta and v. And what we get on the left-hand side is, so we write this as theta plus v theta. So we get this time plus the linear perturbation. And this is supposed to be equal. Again, we look at the linear perturbations. This is delta v. Uh, then this this is v plus delta v. Uh, then this is divided by now v is equal to zero delta. It's, it's just delta v. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm somewhat confused. With that. So we've got delta v minus uh, plus cosine theta minus sine theta delta theta. And this is divided by 1 plus delta v cosine theta minus v sine theta d theta. Okay, we need to go to the next uh, blackboard. Mm, yeah, so if you if you play a little bit more with that, what you get is that delta theta is equal to delta v one minus cosine square theta over minus sine theta equals to minus delta v sine theta. Uh, what does this mean? So we've got our axis x3. Let's say this will be the axis x1 and x2. And assume that R appears to be, for example, this. But if we perform the boost, uh, yeah, so remember that theta is the angle uh, we calculate this way. Theta is the angle between the z axis and our R. And we have found out that if we perform the boost, what happens is that this angle basically decreases a little bit. In other words, uh, for an observer who is boosted with respect to our to, to a usual observer p in the direction of z, sources appear to be uh, concentrated much closer to the direction into which uh, our boosted observer is moving. Basically, if you accelerate in a, in a certain direction by a relativistic, in, in, by, by a very large speed, close to the speed of light, you appear all sources basically move towards the direction uh, into which you have accelerated. Yeah. And that's known as the stellar aberration effect. Uh, interesting thing is that it was discovered fairly early in, I think, 1800s. Uh, students of astronomy could probably correct me. Uh, what was discovered was basically the aberration effect due to the annual motion of Earth around the sun. It, it's, it turns out to be fast enough that you can really notice the subtle changes of relative positions of, of stars um, 
because of the annual motion of Earth around the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, was the derivation clear? It's basically, th there is nothing really strange about it. Uh, it might have seemed a little chaotic, but the basic idea is that uh, you take any null vector, uh, you assume that you know its direction, uh, you parameterize it with this direction of propagation vector, you perform a boost, and if you have done everything correctly, uh, you will get uh, an equation for the boosted direction vector, which is different from the previous one. And what boost causes is basically, it, it, it sort of, uh, it pushes all directions of, 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 of light from, from all sources towards the boost direction. Uh, okay. Very well. As an example of the effects of of uh, light aberration, we'll talk about a uh, uh, another case: the relativistic beaming, the effect of relativistic beaming. So at first, it doesn't appear to be related, but in fact, it's very closely related to the standard aberration effect. So assume that we've got a small light source, which emits light in an isotropic way. So it radiates the same amount of radiation in every direction uh, into every uh, stereographic angle. Mm, and we assume that the uh, that the light has the frequency of omega. Uh, so in its rest frame, this this emission appears to be isotropic, but what happens if we uh, if we look at the situation? So this is isotropic in the rest frame. in the rest frame or in the commoving frame. Uh, we look at that in a strongly boosted frame. Uh, what happens then? Uh, so each of photons coming from, from, from the slide source can be again written as K0, K0R, where R now, R now is the direction of propagation, not the direction from which we see the light coming. But we can still apply uh, a Lorentz transform to that. This time, let it be the Lorentz transform in the minus v direction. So this is uh, this is still the direction of z uh, of r three, but uh, but the velocity is assumed to be negative. The reason is that if we do it that way in this new q frame, this body will appear to be moving in the direction of z with velocity v, which is what I want to achieve. And now. I act with with uh, with this matrix on K, and what you can easily find out is that again, you can obtain the formula for the apparent direction, and it is fairly close related to the previous one. It's basically R one divided by one plus V R three, R two divided by one plus V R three v plus r3 divided by 1 plus v r3. That's pretty much the same equations. But what does it mean? 
first of all, it means that if you move to this boosted frame, the situation looks quite different. Uh, all beams appear to be basically tilted towards the direction of propagation. So our light source is now, uh, now appears to be moving with very fast velocity. And consequently, all these light rays are very much concentrated in the direction into which it is moving, just because of the aberration effect. Uh, yes, and this has a number of interesting consequences. Sorry, sorry this, this doesn't look terribly well. Uh, I could have done a little bit, bit of a better job. Let me try to do it a little better. And now this will be the velocity vector. The assumption is that V is close to one. Uh, now what happens is that most of the uh, emission, uh, even though it appears isotropic in the rest frame, in the observer's frame, it appears to be strongly focused into the, in the direction of propagation because of the aberration effect. But that's not the end of the story. There is more to it. Uh, keep in mind that on top of that, we will also observe, the observer will also see the, um, the Doppler effect. So if you're an observer standing over here, you will see much less light per square, uh, per unit uh, solid angle, because simply most of it is, is, is boosted uh, and up and appears due to aberration to be beamed in the V direction. But on top of that, you will see all the frequencies strongly redshifted. So your omega observer will be much smaller than omega emission. But this means that the uh, each photon will carry much less energy, right? So there will be less photons. And on top of that, each of them will carry less energy than before. But that's not the end of the this, this story. Exactly because of the redshift effect uh, and because of the time transfer effect, you also see fewer photons emitted uh, per unit of time, and all three effects of this, of all of those three effects combined, uh, mean that the apparent luminosity of this object, when you look at it from the back and when you look look at it from the front, can be drastically different. Even though in the rest frame the uh, emission is isotropic, an observer looking exactly into the direction of propagation or close to it will see most of the radiation coming in in, in his or her direction and he or she will see it strongly blue shifted, so more energetic, and also happening at a faster rate if you just measure the number of photons per unit time. Uh, yes, and this effect is seen in ultra-relativistic jets in, in active galactic nuclei. Um, if you see a jet coming towards the, 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 the solar system, towards our galaxy, it, it, it will be fairly luminous, but the counter jet is very often not visible at all because it's much, much dimmer. Okay, thank you very much. Any any questions to this material? Okay, I don't see any questions. In that case, we can go to the next part of the lecture. Mm. Okay. So now it's time to discuss another mathemat strongly mathematical topic, but I think a very interesting one and also a very important one, the tensor algebra. Uh, if you have already had some exposure to GR and theoretical physics, you probably know a bit about tensors, but still the topic is so important that I think that a, a small uh, recapitulation would be necessary. So tensors are a geometrical object would describe quantities which are more complicated than just scalars, numbers, or, or vectors. So things with uh, a preferred direction and magnitude. Uh, and they were known well before the relative, well before special and general relativity, mostly in the continuous media physics. Uh, if you have, uh, if you had a, a lecture in, in simple classical mechanics, you probably you have probably come across the moment of inertia tensor, a matrix which describes the moments of inertia with respect to any axis. Uh, uh, if you also 
had electron continuous media, media you probably know the stress tensor. Um, in electromagnetism, uh, people very often describe the uh, electric properties of, sorry, can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can. Okay, very well. Uh, I just had a notification that my connection is unstable. Uh, okay, there is also the permittivity tensor describing the electric properties of uh, of an anisotropic uh, medium in, in electromagnetism, and there is many, many more. Uh, tensor products are also used quite a bit in quantum information theory to describe systems composed of smaller subsystems. Uh, but in GR, they play, an, I would say, an even more fundamental role. Uh, basically, all important quantities uh, we will discuss in this lecture are of tensorial nature, all most important fields. Uh, and moreover, since we're working on in a space-time, you'll see that we'll be able to combine various quantities, you know, as you know, in, in, in standard re re pre-relativistic physics to be vectors or scalars into higher objects, higher four-dimensional objects of tensorial nature. This may look a bit mysterious, but we will see it in, 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 in an hour. Uh, so what are tensors? In order to understand them, we have to begin with simpler objects. Uh, so we will consider geometric objects as, as something that is defined by its transformation law under the change of frames. So we look at a particular physical situation. There is a number of quantities which describe this situation. Uh, but we can also change our reference frame. Uh, in this case, these quantities would change in general. Uh, however, you will see that there are certain patterns of, of the way they can transform. And depending on how they transform, we will classify our quantities as scalars, vectors, and tensors. And in more advanced courses, you will also encounter um, densities and uh, connections and even more complicated things. So let's begin with the simplest type of objects, uh, a scalar. Mm. Uh, scalars are basically numbers defined at a the point. They do not transform at all. They're frame independent. So you can see here that when I pass from uh, one frame in U to E tilde mu by Lorentz transform, S doesn't change at all. Okay, so scalars were easy. Uh, the second type of, of objects we'll discuss will be vectors. We have already come across them. Uh, these are objects you can you can write formally as a combination of the uh, frame vectors, linear combination with, with coefficients x mu. Uh, when we change our frame vectors, this means that we also have to change the coefficients, basically by multiplying everything by the inverse of, of the matrix here. Uh, so uh, you can solve this equation for, for, for x tilde, and you'll quickly find out that uh, we have a well-defined transformation law. In order to pass from x mu to x tilde mu to the new frame, we just have to multiply all the components by x mu. Uh, the intuition behind, the, behind a vector is that it describes either very small displacements, or in case of special relativity, finite displacements of points. So, if you go from this point to that point, this is the, this is described by a vector, or it can also dis describe velocities. What is the momentary rate of change of position in, in some kind of time or other parameter? Okay. Uh, if you had an algebra course, a, a, a decent linear algebra course in your education, you have probably come across another type of object, so-called covector and one form. So covectors are objects dual to vectors, meaning uh, there are linear functions of vectors which give you scalars. So you can imagine a covector as a small black box, a machine we call psi. You put in a vector, and it gives you a scalar, a number in the end. The assumption is that this is linear, this, this dependence of, of the result on, on the vector we, we put in, and in that case, you can all, always write down the result as a sum over all possible components of our vector x with coefficients psi mu. Uh, 
in a particular frame, where these coefficients are nothing else but what you get when you plug in uh, the frames, uh, the vectors of, of, of our frame one after another into Xi. Mm. So what is the transformation law for this type of object? Uh, so uh, we know that Psi of X is supposed to be Psi mu X mu. What happens when we change our frame? Well, we have to pass to Psi with tilde being Psi on our boosted vectors. That means we have to apply lambda to minus one to every of these vectors here, which in turn means that the uh, Psi mu, the, the components of a one form or, or of a covector transform by mul multiplication with lambda to minus one. This is pretty much the transformation law. Uh, the definition I propose here that covectors are just functions of, of, of vectors uh, looks a bit abstract, but there is a nice geometric intuition behind them. So the intuition is that covectors nicely represent gradients of a function. So imagine we have a function defined in, the, in, in our space time. And we also have a curve defined by this red line here. Uh, the curve is parametrized. We would like to find out how the value of the function changes along this curve. So we calculate df of the, uh, DF of the lambda. Uh, we use the chain rule to, to uh, write this derivative as, first of all, df over dx mu, where x are three co uh, four uh, coordinates, times dx mu over d lambda. This thing here on the right-hand side is obviously a vector. It's a velocity. And the quantity of the, of the on the left-hand side is something that is supposed to give us a scalar, so it has to be a one form. And indeed, it is. It is a covector. So df over dx mu, a covector of, of derivatives of, of a function at a point, it very nicely defines a one form. And then when you... Uh, when you take the contraction with a, with a vector, you, you, you get the rate of change of a given function when you move along, along a curve with this vector being tangent. Uh, is it clear? Do you have questions? OK, probably no questions. So let's move on. Uh, so. In this lecture, we usually work in a particular basis, which is a basis of vectors, e mu, with mu being a, uh, an index. Uh, in this case, it turns out that if you have a given basis of vectors, there is automatically uh, a basis of covectors we get for free. Namely, there is one and only one basis of covectors such that uh, Omega alpha, the, the uh, a particular covector from this basis acting on E beta gives us delta alpha beta. This thing here is called Kronecker delta and it and denotes one if, if alpha is equal to beta and zero otherwise. So in other words, the zero covector acting on E zero is supposed to give us one, but whenever we plug in any other vectors, it will give us zero. Omega one on the other hand will give one if you plug in the vector E1 and zero in all other cases and so on and so on. This basis is called the dual basis to E mu. Uh, and the advantage of using this basis is that in this case, uh, this equation for the action of, of, of a one for one vector is just the summation over all components. There is one important thing here. Mu is not, does not denote uh, the uh, components of each of the vectors, rather it numbers the vectors in a basis. There is a fundamental problem with, with the notation in linear algebra that we use the same notation for the components of a vector, so a set of numbers, and for, for, uh, for a basis, which is a set of vectors. But unfortunately, we have to live with that. You just have to look carefully at the text and uh, try to figure out whether omega alpha is just a component of a given vector alpha, or if it is a basis where omega zero, omega one, omega two, and omega three form a basis of vectors. 
Uh, yes, and on top of that, we've got something called vector covector duality, namely, uh, we could have, we defined the covectors or one forms as black boxes into which you drop in a vector and get a number. But it turns out that you can, in a completely dual way, define vectors as objects into which you, you plug in a covector, a one form, and you get a scalar number. You basically look again at this uh, equation defining psi of x and read it backwards. So we fix x and we drop in various uh, psi mu's, various covectors, and each time we get a number. And this way we get a so-called dual space to the dual space, but it turns out that this is just a standard vector. Uh, it may look strange and abstract, but we will have to, to use it. Okay, uh, excuse me, excuse, excuse me. Uh, sorry, I am back. Okay, this observation that we can, you can consider vectors as objects into which you plug in covectors and get a number, and you can consider covectors as objects into which you plug in vectors and get a number, this justifies a, a, a simple definition of tensors. So a tensor is a multilinear function of vectors and covectors, whatever number, which gives you scalars. So you assume that it has a couple of slots. Uh, here, they're, they're represented as black and red slots. Uh, some of the slots can accept vectors. Other slots accept covectors. We cannot, at the moment, change that. So a given slot either accepts a vector or a covector. Uh, the number of covectors is called k. and the, the number of vectors called L, and and the pair of numbers is, is usually known as valence. And the thing is that if you plug in vectors and covectors into each of these slots, in the end, what you get is a number. And this number is a linear function of each of the slots. And that's basically a tensor. Uh, OK, but this is abstract. How do we describe tensors using numbers? Uh, the answer is that it's relatively simple. So again, we pick a frame. Um, in our case, it will be an orthonormal or a, an inertial frame in U. This way, we also get for free a, a basis for covectors, omega alpha, which is dual to EMU. Uh, and it turns out that you can write the action of, of this tensor T on uh, vector X, vector Y, covector psi, covector mu, and so on and so on, as a sum of uh, a finite set of components, t alpha, gamma, delta, blah, 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 and the components of all vectors and one forms involved. So you basically sum over the first index representing the first slot, over the second index beta with the second vector beta, and so on and so on. And this is a big sum which gives us the number. Uh, this number t alpha beta gamma delta and so on is simply what you what you obtain when you plug into the into the tensor as a black box uh, the vectors from the basis and the one forms from the dual basis as they fit appropriately. Mm. Is it clear? Okay, I think it's clear. Uh, now, the question is, what is the proper transformation law for the components of, of, of this tensor? So we assume that uh, E transforms into some kind of new E tilde uh, by a Lorentz matrix lambda. Uh, we will not derive that, but it's fairly easy to check that T transforms into a new T uh, in the following index. Uh, corresponding to uh, uh, to vector by lambda to minus one, so each lower index by lambda to minus one, and each upper index by lambda. So there is a lot of multiplication involved, but in the end, you get your new components. <laughs> 
Uh, okay, this looks abstract, but we already know at least three types of tensors. The first type of tensor is a zero zero tensor, so something that doesn't accept any vectors and convectors but gives you a number, and that's basically a scalar. So scalars are in our language zero zero tensors. Uh, we've got one zero tensors, tensors with which accept one covector, and these are the standard vectors. They have one up index up, and they transform exactly according to the, to this tensorial rule for one zero tensors. And we also know zero one tensors, which are just covectors. So we have simply enlarged the number of geometric objects uh, we can work with. Okay. I have a question here. Yes. Uh, so suppose you define the vector as like this x mu and mu is at the, at the top. So that means this vector will be defined in the covector basis. But when uh, I will write, write a vector like in terms of basis, so this vector will be defined in this omega mu, sorry, and this a new okay. bottom, right? Uh, I guess it will, the simplest way would be to uh, explain this on the, on the blackboard. So you are kind of right, yes. So we have a, we have the following situation. We've got a vector abstract vector, mm, I'm not done with, sorry. Uh, we've got a vector X, uh, we've got a frame in U. How do you define its components? Uh, there is two ways. One of them is to use the dual coframe. And in that case, uh, uh, sorry, E would have, Mu here and this has a component. I'm sorry, a mu here is the basis vector, not the component, but it's the basis index of components. So first of all, uh, you can define x alpha to be simply omega alpha acting on x. That's a formal definition. But you go, you could also simply state that the vector x is supposed to be the sum of the basis vector e mu with. Uh, appropriate coefficients. So this is two ways to define the basis components, one using simply the, uh, the basis vectors, one after another, but you can also define it by action of the dual basis. Is it clear? Yeah, I mean, it's clear, but mostly we use the second one, right? Because uh, that is, that yeah. is what like, makes me confused because I thought like this, uh, 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 when we write at the top, it becomes vector. When it when we write at the bottom, it becomes covector. So this always confuses me. Like that means I can define any uh, vector in any of these dual spaces, right? That's what you're trying to say. Uh, now, what I'm saying is that when you have got a ve so there is two problems here. One of them is the distinction distinction between the uh, index of of components. So x mu is just a set of numbers x0 to x3. And what I, what this here means is that the vector x as an abstract thing is just a sum of the components x0, a number, times the vector e0. This is a vector, and this is also a vector, plus x1, e1. This is again a vector, plus x2, e2. And this is again a vector, plus x3, e3. And that's again a vector, okay? Uh, and it turns out that if you have a vector and a, and a basis, this decomposition is unique. So each of these numbers is well-defined. Whenever you've got X and you've got E0 to E3, these numbers are already defined by this uh, equation over here. On the other hand, if you have your vectors E mu, you automatically have got formally a number of one forms such that omega of alpha, omega alpha uh, is dual to, to E. And you can formally write that your component, let's say x0 is just omega zero acting on x. That's what I was saying. So at the moment, vectors are things which uh, whose components have an index on the top, 
if you write them in, 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 in a basis. Uh, and you can get these components either by um, basically decomposing your vector in this basis, or there's a tricky way if you can use something called dual basis and just act with this dual vectors on X. But this is this is this is more of of a computational trick we may use sometimes, but less than that. Let's stick to this definition more more often. So we just have a vector space, four dimensional vector space. We've got four vectors which define the basis, and we perform the decomposition. And this gives us x mu with mu on the top, so defining a vector. Okay, then I have another question. Then, like, mm -hmm. uh, since this we define e mu and omega alpha in a such a way that their product should be equal to one, right? So that means I can interchange the basis as well. Like, same omega alpha can become e mu and then e mu become no. omega alpha. No, 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 you cannot do it. They live in different spaces. Oh, so, we've okay. got your space, your vector space. Uh, this is your vector space. Let's call it, uh, we should give it a name. Let's call it A. And if you have, have got a vector space, a space of vectors of a finite dimension, you can also define a space of objects which take vectors from A and give us numbers. That's called the dual space or a space of covectors. But it's a different space. It's related to that one in the sense that for each vector from here you, and each vector from here, you can write kappa of x and it gives you a number. But you cannot exchange them, or at least not yet. Uh, OK, later in this lecture, we'll, we will find a magic solution to this problem. At the moment, we cannot swap objects okay. from the vector space to, to its dual space. Later in this lecture, I'm anticipating it now, we will show that there is a magic thing called the metric tensor, which allows us to do it exactly, to take things from the vector space and consider it a covector and vice versa. But at the moment, we still cannot do it. If you just have a vector space with no additional structures to help you, like a metric or something else, vectors are vectors, covectors are covectors. If you have a vector and a covector, you can take them together, and this gives you a number. For example, if you have kappa and x, you can get kappa of x, which is a number, a scalar. But you cannot swap the uh, this is... position of the x's. Uh, okay. You cannot take vectors from here to here. Uh, what is true is that if you find a basis in, in your vector space, then there is a special privileged um, dual basis in, in, in the, in the covector space, one for which you've got this relation, and it may be useful, but you cannot exchange them. It's just that if you have a basis here, you will also have a basis here. If you find a basis here, you'll find a ba corresponding basis here, but you cannot swap the vector into a vector. It's just there is duality between full a full basis here and a full basis here. OK. OK, thank you. OK, any more questions? I think it's an important material. So if you have problems with that, let me know, because we should we should really have this fun. OK. OK, then there is the next slide, which I think is quite important, although it may look a bit abstract to you. So there is at least two ways to look at tensors and other geometric objects in, in differential geometry. The first one dates back to a guy named Skouten, a mathematician from about 100 years ago. And this is the one we have been following. We define uh, vectors, tensors, and so on by, their, uh, by the way they uh, change under the coordinate transforms. But there is a more abstract, but some, somehow sometimes a little better approach in which you consider tensors as abstract objects, this type of black boxes, which take an, other objects that produce numbers. So a tensor is a multilinear mapping into, into which we, you feed vectors and covectors as appropriate, and then you get a number. However, abstract objects are not really something you like to work with. They, there isn't much you can do with them. We very much prefer to work with numbers. Now, in order to convert your tensor into a bunch of numbers, you need another device called frame or basis. So we take our frame. It gives us a basis of the uh, of the uh, of the vector space corresponding to uh, to our spacetime. 
it gives us also a corresponding basis in the uh, dual space, omega alpha. And now we can use these things in, to convert our tensor as an abstract thing into components, which is a representation of this tensor. And this is a very good representation. You can calculate anything you want uh, given a particular basis. If you have a, a bunch of vectors on, and covectors in this basis, you calculate the action of t on, on those vectors just by summing the uh, coefficients appropriately as, as, we have, as we had it before. So the naive thing would be to, 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 to wonder, you might wonder why we consider this abstract tensor as a tensor at all if you, we can just work with the representations. Why are we doing this? The answer is that this is not the only possible representation. We can always find a different frame or basis. Let's say E tilde or E hat. And in each of them, the set of representing numbers will be different. However, we are guaranteed that uh, whatever scalar we produce at, at the very end, if we uh, multiply this, this tensor by appropriate components of vectors and one forms, the result will be uh, will be the same and frame independent. Uh, what is happening here? Well, we can always go between each of these representations by simply performing an appropriate Lorentz transform of the uh, basis vectors or frames. So you you act with lambda on e and you get uh, on e tilde and you get e. Uh, conversely, you, you act with lambda to minus one and you get e tilde and so on. And you, you've got this type of transformations between any pair of frames or bases. Uh, and now it turns out that the components which we use to represent our tensor, uh, basically they uh, they transform appropriately with, with, this, with this matrix lambda. And now this whole thing has been crafted in, in, in such a clever way that everything is consistent. So you can take your, imagine you're doing a complicated necessary calculation, you pick up a basis, you calculate the representation, you work in this representation, you get a number, but your friend has picked a different one. They will go through different calculations, but in the end, when you apply the transformation laws for the for tensors, you're, you're guaranteed to, to end up exactly with the same results. So. Mm, that's how it works. However, it's still quite useful to think of tensors not as a bunch of numbers which transforms, but rather as something more abstract and fundamental, uh, for which you need a basis in order to convert it to numbers. This way of thinking is, I think, quite useful, and we'll also see it later when we define manifolds and, and the differential geometry. Uh, okay. I think it's enough for the first uh, hour of the lecture. Do you have any questions? I have one, okay. Yes, sure. Uh, okay, so we can like transform from one frame to the other. And yes. we can we can use Lorentz transformation or something. Yes, like. that's right. Okay, but we should get like the same types of tensors as the results. Yes. Uh, okay, you get the same tensor, but in a different representation. So you get uh, oh, okay. you get a set of numbers with lower and upper indices and in the same places, because the place of the index tells you what kind of objects you can fit into a particular slot. So in tensor slots have there are two types of slots, and you cannot uh, you cannot fit a, a vector into a covector slot and vice versa. They just don't fit in. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. If you look more carefully, what what this transformation law looks like, uh, you just use lambda to minus one for each lower index. Use lambda for each upper index, and you perform a full summation. And obviously, what you get will have the same number of lower indices and the same number of upper indices. Okay, uh, I think it's time for a break. So let's have ten minutes of break. Uh, so we meet at 10, 10. So it's time for a 10 minute break. Thank you very much. And we're back with our lecture. So, yes, yeah, so we were discussing the uh, tensors as geometric objects, the relation of tensors as abstract objects to frames or bases, uh, which 
we used to represent them as uh, a bunch of numbers, and how the components of inner particle representations change when we change the frame of basis. It turns out that this whole formalism is designed in such a way that you can use any representation to get precisely the same results. Uh, and then you can switch between various representations using appropriate frame transforms. Mm, okay. Uh, the next topic regarding tensor algebra is making new tensors from tensors in a frame or basis independent way. So uh, this is a, we will discuss a couple of operations which, uh, which can be used to create various types, new types of tensors from the ones we already have. Uh, they're important in the sense that uh, we will encounter them all the time in this lecture. So it's, it's a good idea to have a look at them. Uh, everything is done in a basis independent way in the sense that this, these operations have been defined in a particular frame uh, as operations on components. However, nothing depends on the frame we choose. If you have chosen a different frame and perform the same operation, you will get the same tensor, but in a different representation in a different frame. So the first type of, uh, the first thing we can do is to take a linear combination of tensors of exactly the same valence and the same position of, uh, of indices. So we have one upper index followed by three lower indices in both A and B. So we can take the, their linear combination, whatever it is, and the new object T is basically a tensor of the same valence and the same position of uh, indices. Uh, yes, and it transforms exactly uh, as a tensor. This, this is straightforward to check. Uh, but we can do other things. We can permute the indices. So given a tensor with one upper index alpha followed by beta gamma mu, we can define a new tensor which has the upper index on the second position and which has also a bit of a different order of lower indices. And we consider this a new tensor, even though in practice, the components of this tensor S are pretty closely related to the components of tensor T. You just have to use them in a different order, but we consider this a new tensor. Uh, another important thing is tensor product. So now we imagine we've got two tensors of, of different valences, K1, L1 and K2, L2. We call T and Q. And we can simply multiply them. And the resulting object has uh, obviously more indices. It has basically the number of indices is equal to the sum of indices of which of its individual components, both the upper and the lower. Uh, and this resulting object we call I call it here S mu nu alpha beta is also a tensor. It's easy to check that if these two guys transform under uh, coordinate change uh, by this rule of multiplication by lambda lambda to minus one, so does S, so it's a tensor. And the last thing is the operation of contraction. So imagine you've got a tensor which has uh, in this both upper and lower indices, let's say one upper index and three lower ones. Then we can pick a pair of index with, with one of them being the upper one and the other being the lower one. And we can simply sum over these indices, meaning writing alpha, beta, alpha mu. Uh, recall that we are using here the Einstein summation con convention, which means that we should read this as a sum over this index alpha. So this is basically T0, zero, zero, beta mu, T11, one, one, beta mu, T22, two, two, beta mu, plus T33, three, three, beta mu. And this object, on the other hand, is a tensor, but of lower valence without these two indices. So this is an operation which reduces the valence of tensors, reduces the uh, number of upper and lower indices by one. And we can, of course, combine all of these operations. Mm. Any questions? I don't see any. Uh, since we are allowed to permute indices, uh, I would like to mention something very important, the permutation in symmetries of, of tensors. Um, we will focus on symmetric two tensors, so the simplest possible objects which can have symmetries. Uh, so some tensors might have a particular property, namely if you plug in the vectors x and y, uh, 
you get the same result as if you have plugged in the vectors y and x. So it doesn't depend on in, in which order you plug in the vectors into a particular pair of slots. And we call such tensor symmetric. This is not a generic property. In general, tensors do not have this property, but there is a subspace of tensors which do. Uh, and we can recognize them by the fact that the uh, components of the of the tensor are the same uh, when you permute the indices. So let's say zero one components is the same as one zero, three one components is the same as one three. Uh, that's the equation you see, we see here on the top. The same way we can decide we can define anti-symmetric or skew-symmetric indices in these in the, uh, uh, anti-symmetric or skew-symmetric tensors in, in a pair of indices. Uh, these are those for which, uh, when you plug in uh, the vector x, y, you get the minus of the result you have you would have obtained if you plugged in the y vector first and the x as the second one. Uh, again, if you look at the components at a particular representation in a particular frame, uh, you can recognize it because you see that the uh, that the sign of, of t changes when you uh, change the order of indices. So t0, 1 is equal to minus t1, 0. t3, 2 is equal to minus t2, 3. And now a control question to everyone. What about, let's say, component t0, 0? What happens when you we have when we have a skew symmetric tensor? What is the component T00 in this case? It will be zero, I guess. Yes, of course it must be zero because T00 must be equal to minus T00. So it has to be zero. So skew symmetric tensors by definition need to have zeros on the uh, in the diagonal terms, of course. Uh, these are only the simplest possible uh, symmetries of, of tensors. Uh, there are much more complicated types of multi-index symmetries possible. And in this lecture, when we will talk about the Riemann tensor, you'll encounter somewhat more complicated symmetries. But at the moment, I'm just signaling that the, these two types of symmetries are, are always possible. So when you have a, an object with a, lot of sim, with a lot of indices, some of them on the top, some of them on the bottom, you can always ask whether this tensor is symmetric or skew-symmetric with respect to any pair of indices at the same level. OK, uh, another thing. There is a special tensor uh, uh, we have here. This is the unit tensor. We'll call it the unit tensor. Uh, it's sometimes written as an abstract one in more mathematical oriented literature. And it simply has, it's, it's a 1, 1 tensor. It has one upper index and one lower index. And the indices are basically equal to the Kronecker delta. So they're equal to one when mu is, sorry, it should be mu and mu not alpha beta. That's my mistake. Uh, if the indices are uh, the same, it's equal to one. If they're not, it's equal to zero. Uh, and it turns out that this, this property holds in all possible frames. If in one frame your tensor has these components, then this will hold in all possible frames. And the nice thing about this tensor is that when you multiply a vector, when you contract a vector um, with this particular index, you're back to the same vector x mu. And the same goes for a one form. Uh, if you take a product of this tensor delta mu nu and then you perform a contraction with, of the upper index with the lower index here, you go back to the original one form mu. You can check yourself that this really happens. There is nothing special about that. Okay. Uh, in fact, in this lecture, we have already defined one tensor, but you have probably missed that. This is basically the metric. This is basically the scalar product. Recall that the scalar product we have defined, a product between two vectors, the one which has minus at the zero in the zero component and pluses in other components. This is obviously a bilinear mapping of two vectors. Uh, if it is so, then it must be a zero to tensor formally, and it is. Uh, the corresponding tensor is called usually the metric tensor, and it's written with the letter G. And this is probably the single most important object we will talk in this lecture about. So uh, we can altern alternatively write that the product of two vectors is just the uh, is just what you get when you take your vector your your metric tensor and stick in the vectors x and y into the first and second slot. Uh, 
we assume that our metric tensor is symmetric. So it doesn't really matter whether you stick x to the first slot or to the second one. The order this is irrelevant here. And we know that in an inertial frame, we have assumed that our g is this matrix eta mu nu, which, is, which has only diagonal terms with the minus 1 at 0, 0, and plus 1s at different uh, for the spatial indices. Uh, a small warning. Uh, this is the most common conversion, convention in, in physical literature to assume that the metric tensor in relativity has minus one for the time like for the time components and plus ones for the three spatial ones. But there are some people who use the inverse one. Uh, so some some use plus one uh, for the spatial ones and minuses for this uh, plus one for the time one and minuses for the spatial ones. Uh, always check a given paper for the convention. Uh, good relativity papers announcing the introduction which convention they use. This one is by far more common. Okay. Any questions? No, probably not. Okay. And now we will discuss another operation. When we have a metric tensor, we can do uh, one more interesting operation, so-called index raising and lowering. Before we do it, we begin by defining something called the inverse metric tensor. <laughs> this is a tensor of valence 2, 0, as opposed to 0, 2 for the standard metric. So one that has two upper indices instead of two lower indices. And it's defined by the equation over here. Uh, if you take the product of this inverse, inverse tensor by the standard metric tensor, you get delta. Uh, we use the same letter for both the metric and the inverse metric tensor, which at first may look confusing, but you will see that actually it makes perfect sense. Uh, so G with upper indices is the inverse metric tensor, G with lower ind indices is called the metric tensor. And they're related by this by the, the this equation here, which simply tells you that G is the inverse of the matrix, G upper index is the inverse of the G lower index matrix. So in our case, nothing changes. The inverse metric looks exactly the same. But this is because we are using a very special frame. In more general situations, the inverse metric will be something more complicated, unrelated in a simple way with G. OK. And now we can play the following game. Imagine we've got a vector. We can take the standard metric tensor and just uh, multiply it here and then perform contraction of the first index um, of the metric with the index of with the upper index of, of our vector x. And this way we have defined something which has one lower index and this is a proper one form. And we will write this one again, we will de denote this one form by exactly the same letter x, but with an index, but with a lower index. And we will consider this thing as a as an object very closely related to the vector itself, however, of a different valence. Obviously, we can play the same game with a covector, so or or one form. So we we take this one form and we uh, we perform the contraction of this index with the first index of the inverse metric, and this way we obtain something that is a vector, which we also denote with the same letter xi just with the upper index. Now, the funny thing is that we can play this game again. So given this lower index version of x, we can raise it again using the inverse metric. And now see what happens. Since we have demanded these things to be due, to be uh, inverse of each other, this product here gives me the unit tensor delta mu nu. And the unit tensor multiplied by, by my original x is just the the, the, the the components of the vector x I started from. So you see that the lowering and, and raising of an index are dual operations. You can lower your index and raise it then back with, with the inverse metric and you're back with what, what you started from. And the same goes for covectors. Uh, you can first raise this in covector index, obtain a, the vector. Then you can take this vector, lower this index, and you're back where what we started from. So we have created a, a perfect duality between vectors and uh, covectors. Uh, 
before that i was I, we took a lot of of effort in order to avoid vector in order to distinguish vector and covectors and now i'm telling you that if you have got a metric you don't really have to distinguish them all that much because you've got a machine which converts vectors into covectors and covectors into vectors that's true but you can only do it when you've got this machine called the, the metric tensor without that vectors and covectors are completely different objects and you cannot um you cannot change the character of, of, of an object. Uh, you can play this game using any of the metrics in this is you can also perform the contraction with the second uh, index or with the first index and you get the same result. Uh, the inverse metric is also symmetric so you can also perform the contraction uh, when raising index with the uh, with whichever index you want. Uh, on top of that, uh, now with, given the metric and the inverse metric, the covectors also have got their products. So you have two covectors, xi or and zeta. You can simply take their sum with the inverse metric. This is a scalar, and that's again a, a perfectly valid product of two uh, covectors. Or you can just raise their indices. And when their, their indices are raised, you can take the standard product. But it turns out that it's the same thing. It's just that when you have got a metric and an inverse metric, there is also a way to calculate the product of covectors. This product has exactly the same properties of this, as the product of vectors. It is symmetric, but not positive definite. Uh, so you can have the same way time-like, space-like, and now uh, covectors. Uh, now I can also introduce a very common notation for the product, x times y. Uh, relativity people very often write it simply as x lower index mu, y higher upper index mu, or vice versa, x upper index mu, y lower index mu. Obviously, this is the same thing as, uh, as using this uh, notation over here. It's just by far most common in relativity literature. So when you see an object x mu and, and this and some object y with the lower index mu. This is just the scalar product written in a fancy way. OK, on top of that, uh, you can play this game with any tensors, not only vectors or, or, or uh, covectors. Namely, if you have got a tensor with one upper index or more upper indices, you can uh, contract this index with the metric and obtain a tensor which has uh, this one index lowered. Uh, again, by the the standard notation in the standard notation, you use the same letter for this tensor and that tensor. They have strictly speaking different valences. The if the initial one was KL, the new one will be K minus one L plus one. And we also um, and in our convention, we also keep the position of the index uh, among all indices fixed. So. You see the sigma is written as the second index of all of them, simply because nu was the second index uh, in the original tensor. This way, you can raise this index back, and you will be back uh, to the same to the same tensor as, as, as before. And you can also perform raising the same way. Uh, again, you have to remember to keep the position of the index, uh, meaning the, the, the order of the index. Again, this, these these operations are dual. You can uh, lower this index again and go back to your original tensor. So somehow the distinction between the valence k l and k minus one l plus one somehow begins to blur once you have a metric tensor. Still, people tend to uh, think this way and that we are dealing with different tensors. Any questions to this? Uh, part. We will also do a, a, a few uh, blackboard exercises on index raising and lowering, so don't worry. If it sounds too abstract to you, you will see that practical calculations with this with these formulas are much simpler than it seems. They are more difficult on conceptual level than on practical applications level. You will see it later. OK. Uh, OK, this is a, an illustration of what is going on here. So as I told you, 
tensors are objects which have slots of different kinds. The black slots which accept vectors, the red slots which accept covectors, and in principle you cannot fit, you cannot stick a, a, a vector into a covector slot. But once you have a metric, an inverse metric, you can use them as effective adapters which convert the type of objects uh, and this way allow you to, to stick a covector into a vector slot. You basically use use this metric to raise the index of your covector, change it into a vector, and now you can uh, fit it into the uh, vector tensorial slot. And also you can use a, an adapter in a covector slot um, in order to fit in a vector. Uh, and yeah. And now you consider this whole setup T together with these uh, metric tensors as your new tensor, which has a different valence. And that's it. And also we, we, we have shown that if you if you if you use two two such adapters on one slot, uh, then the action of each adapter cancels cancels the other one. If I took a standard metric on top of the inverse metric over here, this would be just um, equivalent to not having any adapter at all. That's how index raising and lowering works in practice. OK. Uh, lowering and raising indices opens up the possibility to do some more operations. Namely, we can now trace over any pair of indices. So if we have a tensor which with two lower indices, uh, we can raise one of them and then perform the trace. So we can calculate t beta beta with beta being on the top. And that's basically equivalent to taking the uh, product t alpha beta with the inverse metric g alpha beta. And because of the summation convention, this is basically summing over all possible uh, components, all possible pairs of indices. Uh, and we can play the same game with uh, two upper indices, for example, mu and beta over here. We we'll just lower the second one and perform the summation by writing the same index over here. And we get, an, uh, as a result, an object which has only two free indices, mu and alpha. Yeah. And that's the end of the, uh, of the lecture about the, uh, about the tensor algebra. Uh, do you have any questions at that stage? If not, then we go straight to the uh, to the blackboard, and I've got a few things, uh, a few exercises to do. Uh, okay. Let's go to a new blackboard. Okay, I think it would be good if you tried to participate. Um, so let's first work a bit on index raising and lowering. So imagine we've got a vector which co with components x0, x1, x2, x3. Uh, and the question is, what are the components of this vector uh, if we lower the index? Uh, does anybody have any idea? Okay, we need to perform the contraction with the metric tensor. And this metric tensor is, as you remember, minus one, 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 and zeros everywhere. So we are on the left with the diagonal term, so it will be g zero zero x zero plus g one one x one plus plus g three three x uh, and this is, however, this is only true because we are in an inertial frame. G zero zero is minus one. Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry, oh, that's not correct. So yeah, there's just the, 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 so let's begin with the zero, zero term, uh, with the zero component. Uh, 
so x0 is basically g0 alpha x alpha g1 alpha x alpha g2 alpha x alpha g3 alpha x alpha but g0 alpha is equal to 0 for all components 1 to 3 so we have just g0 0 x0 g1 1 x1 because again only the first component is not non-vanishing among all one alpha and the same for here and the same for this one here and that's just minus x0 x1 x2 and x3 so in an inertial frame index lowering is just changing the sign of the first component over here and there isn't much else to say on the other hand if you take a one form which is psi 0 psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 then the the upper index version has components of minus psi 0 psi 1 psi 2 psi 3 so yeah in an inertial frame not much is to be done you just change the sign of the zero component and this way you change the uh, erase or lower the index okay we can now work a bit on taking the trace so we've got a tensor s mu alpha beta and we would like to trace over the first two indices and this way we would produce a one form because that would leave one lower index so we calculate s mu mu beta what is that any one is there anyone who would help me with that how how do you calculate this trace Okay, we have to use the uh, Einstein summation con uh, convention. So this is a, 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 an object with one free index beta. And these indices are supposed to be summed over. So we take the 0, 0 component plus S11 component plus S22 component plus the S33 component. And that's how you compute the trace over two indices, one of which is the upper one and one of the which is the lower one. So nothing strange here. What happens if you have got an object which has two indices, but on the same level? You'd like to take the trace. This time, if you trace over this, this pair of indices, you will be left with a scalar, so there will be no external indices. But in order to perform the trace, you need to lower one of them. So what you have here is basically G alpha beta, R alpha beta. So the sum is over all possible pair of indices, but so in principle over 16 terms, but it's obvious that all terms except the diagonal one with ones will vanish. And the four diagonal ones are fairly simple. It's minus R zero zero plus R one one plus R two two plus R three. So taking the trace turned out to be relatively easy, but since the two indices were at the same level, we have to remember that we take the zero, zero, 001 with a minus because we are effectively taking a sum with the metric tensor. Okay. Uh, was it clear? Okay. I suppose it was. So we go to lecture to the next slide. Now we will look at a particular tensor. In order to familiarize ourselves with the tensor algebra and how, how it works, uh, in order to learn how to work with, with, with indices, uh, 
we will look at a particular tensor called the Faraday tensor. Uh, it's a strange name because it was defined way after Faraday was dead, uh, but it sort of honors Faraday as the one of the fathers of electromagnetism. Uh, it's a tensor which combines the electric and magnetic field. into a single object. Uh, it's a tensor of valence to zero, so it has two upper indices, and we are seeing, and it is anti-symmetric. Uh, and it's defined in the following way. The components F O I, which are minus the components F I O, are supposed to be the components of the electric field, I is just one, two, three. Obviously, the component F00 has to vanish, but F01 does not. It is just given by the electric field. And then the components F12 equal to minus F21. That will be the third component of the magnetic field. F23 equal to minus F32 is equal to the one component and f31 equal to minus f13 is the second component of the magnetic field so we can write it as a matrix in an initial frame f mu nu is just zero e1 e2 e3 minus e1 minus E2, minus E3. We've got zeros on the diagonal because it's an anti-symmetric tensor. And here we've got B3 and minus B3, minus B2, B2, B1, minus B1. Right. Uh, so the first thing you notice is that the corresponding matrix is anti-symmetric, and that's, yeah, that's to be expected. Uh, now the question is, what is F with upper index and the lower index? F mu nu with lower nu. How do we calculate that? Uh, is there anybody to help me? Well, you have a chance to uh, practice tensorial calculations. Okay, I don't see anybody, so let me let me do the calculation myself. So f mu nu is equal to f, let's say mu sigma g sigma nu, uh, sorry, sigma. Here we are contracting the second index of the first tensor with the first index of the of this one. So we can write it as matrix multiplication. That would be one option. Mm. But we can also do it differently, step by step. So, F mu i, where i is one to three components. That's F mu mu g mu i. The metric is minus one, 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 and zeros. So again, only the diagonal uh, terms will survive here. And these diagonal terms here are always one, so this is just F mu i, right, with no change. And F mu zero, that's F mu mu g mu zero. Uh, again, only the diagonal term survives, so 
the only term which survives is the one in which mu is equal to zero. All other vanish. But here we have to switch switch the sign because g0 zero, zero is minus. So we've got g minus mu zero. Okay, and that's enough. We we have all our components and we see that f mu nu is zero minus e1 minus e2 minus e3 minus e1 minus e2 minus e3 zero b3 minus b2 b1 zero zero minus b1 minus b3 b2 uh, and this matrix is not anti-symmetric anymore so there is a big lesson here uh, if you have a tensor which is anti-symmetric in a pair of indices this is sort of obvious when you when they're on the same level you can simply sw switch the uh, position of the tens of, of, of the indices and the sign changes. But when you look at the representation with, where the indices are on different levels, uh, the anti-symmetric property is not that obviously visible because you cannot just switch the uh, ordering of the indices. You would also have to raise and lower them in order to go back to the same representation. So F upper index mu and F lower index mu is not an anti-symmetric matrix, even though F is an anti-symmetric tensor by itself. You can also check as a homework that the lower index representation uh, is anti-symmetric in that sense and is represented by an anti-symmetric matrix. Okay. Uh, we will go to the next problem. And the next problem is the Lorentz transform, Lorentz transformation of F mu nu. And from that also of E and B, the electric and magnetic vectors. So we take a Lorentz transform as we have learned it before. Again, it will be a transform in the direction of Z because a general one would be a bit harder to deal with on algebraic level. And this is general enough. You can always um, perform a rotation and align your direction of boost with Z. So there is no real generality loss if you assume the boost to be along the z-axis. And we know that f mu nu in a new frame, that's f mu nu lambda mu bar nu lambda mu bar nu. Mm, OK, so let's write it this way. This is lambda nu bar nu, f nu nu, lambda nu bar nu. This almost looks like a matrix product of the matrix lambda, matrix f, and matrix lambda again, but it doesn't really work all that well yet. Why? Because this index over here is summed with the second index over here. In order to get a proper representation, you'd have to take the, the transpose of that. So on a matrix level, this is lambda times F times lambda transpose, and we take the index representation of this matrix. Uh, okay, in this case, it doesn't make much of a difference because the matrix is symmetric. However, in general, you should keep in mind that when you look at expressions of this kind, and you want to transform them into a matrix product because we know how to multiply matrices. This is fairly easy. You have to make sure that the second index of the preceding object is contracted with the first index of the 
next one. And then the second index of the next one is contracted with the first index of, of, of this one here. If it's not the case, you have to use a trace here. Okay, so we have gamma zero zero minus gamma v zero zero minus gamma v one one gamma zero 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 and we are supposed to multiply it by e one e two e three minus e one minus e two minus e three. Here we have zeros, and here we have B3 minus B2, B1 minus B3, B2 minus B1. And then this is again multiplied by gamma 0, 0 minus gamma V, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 0 minus gamma V, 0, 0, gamma. Okay, it looks like a matrix multiplication uh, exercise. So in order not to waste time, I will just write down the result because that's multiplying three matrices, not a very difficult one, but it's four by four matrices. So the result I got was zero gamma E one no, I will do it a bit differently. Oh. So the result is a pretty big, big matrix, and I will need a lot of space for it. Mm, yeah, so I get zero over here, gamma E1 minus gamma V, B2, gamma E2 plus gamma V, B1, gamma square E3 minus gamma square P square E3. Here I get minus gamma E1 plus gamma V B2 and a zero here, minus gamma E2 plus gamma V B2. And here I get minus gamma squared V squared E3 minus gamma squared E3. Uh, you can check yourselves that we have the anti-symmetric property preserved, namely this one, this term over here is the minus of this term over here. This is the minus of this term over here and so on. Here we get B3. This one remains unchanged. This is interesting. Uh, here we get minus gamma B2 plus gamma V E1, gamma, B1 plus gamma V B2 minus B3 here, gamma B2 minus gamma V1 minus gamma B1 minus gamma V3 here. Okay. So what is the purpose of this complicated exercise? We have transformed our uh, Faraday tensor from one frame to another, and we have found out that the new electric and magnetic fields, which we can read off the uh, this tensor, so th this row over here is supposed to be the new electric field in our new frame, and this is supposed to be the new magnetic field in the new frame. Well, it turns out that they transform in a rather non-trivial way, namely, let me go to the next. On here. Namely, what we have here is that the new electric field is basically gamma E1 minus B2 
EP2. E2 is equal to gamma E2 plus B, B1. And E3 is equal to E3. Whereas the magnetic field transforms like The bottom line is we recovered the non-trivial transformation rules for the electric and magnetic field um, when changing the inertial frame. They look rather random. It's difficult to guess where they come from. They're difficult to interpret when we look at E and B as two free vectors. But when we combine them into this one single object, the Faraday tensor, it turns out that Lorentz boosts uh, this takes into account automatically the transformation laws for the electric and magnetic field under Lorentz boosts. Uh, so the component along the direction of boost is conserved in both electric and magnetic field, and there is additional terms uh, in the transverse directions. Any questions to this? Okay, I don't see any questions. So the last thing I wanted to show you we have three more minutes. We don't have much time to talk about that, but I have prepared a Python notebook where I wanted to show you what, how exactly we see a, a, an object with very high relativistic velocity passing us uh, when moving with constant speed. Uh, I wanted to create animations, plots, and other things. I didn't manage to finish it, but there is still a number of interesting things. If you are familiar with Python notebooks, you should be able to use it using Jupyter or whatever else. So here's the situation. We've got an observer. We've got a source, luminous source, which moves um, along a line with certain velocity. It passes us at, at the closest distance B. And well, you've got the uh, relation between the emission time and the observation time in the observer's frame. Uh, and based on that, we've got the plots of the emission time versus the observation time. Uh, and more interestingly, we've got the position on the sky versus the observation time. So how this object appears to be passing over the sky. What is interesting is that slowly moving objects, well, they sim simply correspond to a symmetric function over here, more or less. So uh, the, we first see the object uh, on the front, then it slowly moves, passes us uh, at 90 degrees and moves uh, outward, and this is a symmetric situation. But for a slow, quickly moving source, we see that the body appears to be motionless, appears to be exactly on the front for a much longer time, and then appears to be moving very, very quickly for a short period of time, and then again uh, slowly uh, moves to the opposite side of the sky. And there is also redshift as a function of, of time. We see that the redshift is the quickly moving body, body appears to be very strongly blue shifted for a long time. And then in a short brief moment, uh, in a relatively brief moment, uh, the redshift changes from negative to strongly positive when the body passes us. And the luminosity of the body and the frequency changes very quickly. So if you're curious, this will be uploaded to the uh, course webpage. You will be able to play with that. Um, it's 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 just for you. Okay, I think this is this is the end of the lecture. So thank you very much. We will see each other next week, and well, good luck with the first problem sheet. So thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye.